I'd like to introduce onto the stage right now Ian Pearson, who's a futurist at Futurizen, as well as Omar Yagi, the founding director of the Berkeley Global Institute, Science Institute. Welcome. In my field, I'm a, I'm a chemist, and uh, I explore into materials. And if you step back and think about those materials that have helped build uh, our, our society and uh, cities, uh, you won't come up with more than four or five. For example, steel and concrete, um, materials like zeolites that, that refine petroleum, every drop of petroleum goes through a zeolite, uh, silicon for communication, computing, and alloys for transportation, for air, airplanes and so on. And those are all inorganic, they're mineral based. And there are two others, polymers for plastics, and, and they are organic, and drugs. And beyond that, we don't have anything else. These are the fundamental building blocks of our society. So in my research, we've been able to combine these two together to take advantage of the softness of organic and the hardness of the inorganic. And this basically created an explosion of new materials in which the components are inorganic and organic, and they are stitched together covalently or strongly to create robust materials that now can be fine-tuned on the atomic nano level that we cannot fine-tune the present materials. And so this explosion of materials is leading to a personalization of many things that we normally think about as being a collective uh, uh, municipality type of uh, service and that, for example, one of the things that these materials do is to extract water from the air. Okay, so there, are, I don't need to mention here uh, the the challenge of water, but uh, there are major cities uh, in in the world, eleven major cities that are uh, running out of water. One third of the world is lives in stressed regions. Uh, with uh, either no access to clean water or with uh, um, you know little water um, to to uh, you know for agriculture or for household use, what we're talking about are materials that could basically be in every home, and they would extract the water from the atmosphere, both a humid atmosphere and more importantly, uh, low humidity atmosphere, humidity as low as five percent and therefore be able to uh, water a home independently of the grid or carry your own personal water supply in your hand that basically extract the water from the air, concentrate it into these materials and produce it as liquid water, pure liquid water. So we'll, we'll dig a bit more into some of that work, Omar. I just wanted to get Ian your take on well, as you, a high-level view, is as you look at the, the future cities, what are some of the big changes and challenges you see coming over the next few years? I think in the short term, it's more of the same. But if you go further in the future, we see new building construction techniques using high-pressure nozzles to grow uh, buildings in much the same way that trees grow, for example, you know, phloem and xylem uh, tubes, which can give you uh, very, very tall buildings. I think by 2050, for example, we will have some buildings maybe 30 kilometers tall, uh, which might be used as spaceports and things like that. Uh, that's very much taller than buildings we have today. The tallest building in Europe is only 318 meters. So 30 kilometers is 100 times taller than the Shard in London. Um, so that's pretty tall. Uh, we will also have a great deal of robotics and artificial intelligence in cities, and they'll be used in construction and also the maintenance of the city, running the city, doing all of those sorts of jobs. Um, that, to me, means that we won't need a lot of the people doing those kinds of jobs, but we find alternative roles uh, for the people, upskilling those people using AI, so I don't see AI as a threat. But we do see some dangers in there as well. I mean, even today's newspaper uh, carries this major threat that, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, widespread uh, disease uh, could be a major threat to humanity. A lot of people in my profession are saying this is one of the top 10 risks for the next century, is the uh, you know, global uh, spread of disease and so on. 
But there are other areas, you know, things like uh, solar power and so on, which are very encouraging. Um, people at the moment are tremendously worried about things like climate change. Uh, to me, I don't, I don't get worried about that at all because, you know, by 2030, you know, when uh, electricity is only one or two cents per kilowatt hour because you get it from solar, no one's going to be buying the oil. So uh, we won't be using fossil fuels much after 2030. In fact, the maximum price you'd be able to sell oil in 2030 would be $30 a barrel. If it costs more than that, you're going to use electricity produced by solar. So uh, we're already solving the, the climate change problems, and I don't lose any sleep about those at all. Uh, other areas like the transport technology, I think the, the car industry, you know, going for these self-driving cars that we were just hearing about, I personally think that is the wrong model. And what we will more likely see are these uh, demonstrations you see outside, you know, these pods with the things that Next or Nest pods. And, um, you know, the, using those with smart infrastructure is about 100 times cheaper than using self-driving cars. So that, to me, is a much more viable, much more cost-effective solution for doing transport. So whichever way you look at it, future cities could be a lot cheaper and much more efficiently run than the ones we have today. Omar, I want to get back to some of the work you've been doing with metal organic frameworks, MOSS. Just run us through very, very briefly, what are those on, on a high level? And where now, uh, you've told us a little bit about some of the use cases, but how could they be implemented into cities? Is it a case of building new buildings with them for them to be able to capture water, for example, or some of the, the greenhouse gases in the air? How, how do you see those actually being implemented into the cities in the future? Yeah, so um, the materials I'm talking about are called metal organic frameworks, and now people call them MOFs for short. Uh, but as I mentioned, they are component, their components are inorganic and organic, and they're stitched together to make large uh, structures that have pores. And uh, just to give you an idea, for a gram of such a material, which is not more than, you know, let's say a US dollar coin, uh, it has a surface area of 10,000 meters square per gram. Okay, that surface area is basically the footage of one gram of this material. And that's a space into which you can store um, molecules like carbon dioxide or hydrogen, store hydrogen for, for, uh, as a fuel, but also, as I mentioned, water. But the other thing that is happening in this chemistry is that it's so easy you know, once you figure out how, you, how to put these components together, you can put many different con components. Millions and millions of various components could be linked in the same way that we have discovered how to do the first uh, members of these, of these MOFs. Uh, so it's, they're easy to make. They're made from widely uh, uh, known uh, components or, or widely available components. And they are also not very expensive to make. Uh, and the starting materials are also not very expensive. And so it means that perhaps in the future, now I'm thinking, you know, uh, way into the future, 10, 20 years from now, perhaps we can get people to make their own personalized MOFs or their own personalized materials that would suit their own environment. So, for example, detecting contaminants in a home, whether it's, uh, you know, whatever they may be, uh, contaminants or toxic, toxic gases um, um, or uh, trapping uh, gases that may be harmful or trapping uh, molecules that may be helpful, whether it's for home use or for agriculture and so on and, and so forth. Depending on where you are in the world, perhaps there might be a way to dial in the qualities of the moth that you want. and either the components are shipped to you so that you can just mix them up and make those materials um, on your own or the material is shipped to you. And so, so I, I see personalization as a major, I think, uh, um, um, evolution of, of where ma making new materials is, is, is so heading. So would these, would these MOFs be integrated into some of the building materials used to build houses, for example, or? and therefore the house itself almost can sustain itself either by capturing water or, or whatever the, the moth is able to do? 
Yeah, I mean, I think if you think about materials today, a material that you make has only one function. So one material, one function. Mm. We would love to have materials that can carry out many different functions at the same time. So it could be a structural function, a robustness function to, to build a structure, but also it could be a detector, or it could be a counter, or it could be a, a, a material that also can discriminate between incoming uh, uh, threats, let's say, or uh, signals. So, so could we, um, um, the, the question is, uh, I think in the, in the context of what you're asking, um, could we make materials that potentially can carry out multiple functions rather than function in a serial fashion? Maybe they can function also in a, in a parallel fashion and have multiple functions. And I think that this chemistry I'm talking about, this new chemistry, is, uh, is a very good step towards, uh, towards that. Let me add just one more component. You know, our body works on sequences of information. If it's a, you know, like in DNA, you have a sequence of nucleotides, and depending on the specific sequence, you can synthesize certain proteins that our body wants, needs. Um, perhaps we can make materials that have such sequences that can code for very specific operations and very specific properties, and that they can be included in uh, household products or construction materials and, and so on. Ian, yeah. I, want to, I want to get your take. Omar, they mentioned personalization. How big a, a deal is 3D printing going to be in the future developments of cities? I, I think tremendously important. Uh, when you're building a new building, you can use the, we just saw a video of the uh, uh, 3D printing for you know, one of the uh, types of buildings. I mean, that obviously is very, late, very early stages of R&D. In the future, we would expect 3D printing to be able to make any kind of a building very rapidly. Now, obviously, you need to know who's going to be living in that building. You want to be able to personalize it. We would expect lots of drone workers to be used. So if you want to change what the outside of your building looks like, you know, you fly a few drones up, they do the little customization. But importantly, when you're inside the building, uh, you have access to augmented reality. When you're looking at a wall, it's just a dumb concrete wall, which has been 3D printed. Uh, but when you look at it with your augmented reality glasses, which are coming later this year, so even in a few years, you'll be able to look at it and you will see the most luxurious apartment you've ever been in. So that allows you to have digital architecture superimposed on top of the physical architecture. So that means you can make buildings very rapidly, very cheaply, using customized materials, and then you customize them psychologically to meet the, uh, the requirements of the people living in them too. Now that can be totally intuitive. You don't have to talk to a box in the corner and say, you know, Alexa or Google, you know, do this or do that. Uh, you can actually tap directly into your nervous system and into your emotional state using technologies which are developing quite quickly called active skin, where you can put electronics straight into the skin surface in contact with your nerve endings and your blood capillary uh, you know, we've, we've 15 years, 20 years now, we've been able to detect your emotional state. Your building that you're living in can, de can adapt directly to whether you're feeling relaxed or whether you're stressed, whether you need to be stimulated or whether you need to be soothed down. Uh, the building can adapt to all of those things in the future. That's the ultimate in personalization. I have a, a couple of questions. <laughs> Firstly, on the uh, augmented reality front, that's, that's an interesting thought, but I mean, we've already seen, you know, people not wanting to wear glasses for long periods of time. Are you suggesting that this technology becomes small enough that it perhaps is a, is a contact lens or some sort? Sure. That a, how do you see that playing out? Well, I mean, the very latest generation of augmented reality glasses already is coming on the market, and it's using direct retinal projection. It produces an image straight onto your retina. Now, way back in 1991, as a futurist, I was able to project that to the end of the curve. And where it's ultimately going to go is active contact lenses. You wear two contact lenses, you will get an ultra high resolution image straight onto your retina, uh, indistinguishable from the real life. It's as high resolution as your retina. So whichever direction you're looking at tracks the directions we can superimpose the appropriate imagery. So without wearing anything other than contact lenses, you can customize every single thing you're looking at. 
uh, change what its appearance is, superimpose stuff on it. So as you're walking down the street, your favorite celebrities can be walking past you. You can superimpose those images on the people. Um, you can change what the buildings look like. You know, your entire images that you're seeing during the day are entirely personalized to your psyche. So um, that's, that's really what it brings. And the skin you mentioned as well, that presumably is electrical signals between the, the building and, and the skin, is that right? Um, the, the, the skin is an interface, so rather than you having to say uh, to a computer AI, you know, at the moment you talk to Alexa or Siri and you say, you know, Siri do this or Alexa do that, you shouldn't have to do that. If you can tap directly into your brain, directly into your emotions, directly into your uh, state picked up from your peripheral nervous system which can detect stress and so on, then you can make the, the AI can basically uh, proactively make your environment responsive to you. Nobody else will see the same environment, but it'll be personalized to you and customized to you, and you will feel much more relaxed, much more indulged mm. by the city around you. Omar, I want to get your take on not, not active skin or AR contact lenses, but on 3D printing, because uh, we, we've spoken about that previously. How big a, a role will it play in the, the, the future of cities when it comes to building new buildings or, or structures? Oh. I think it's a powerful technology. And, uh, and I think blending uh, polymers or building materials or uh, cement or whatever um, you're using with various compo other components in various proportions becomes much, much easier and more tailorable. So I, I, I think that, that, um, that that's quite amenable to incorporating um, molecular materials, let's say, materials that can act in a precise and predetermined way um, more easily into day-to-day -day products. Yeah. Uh, and, and does it have a bit, does, does it, you see it really reducing the cost of building buildings and cities? Yeah, I can't comment on that, but I, I think that uh, uh, that it will be very useful and, and more widely used than, than we see today, yeah. Do, do you see artificial intelligence at all crossing over into some of the work you're doing when it comes to the development of materials and perhaps the role it may play in, in the future construction um, industry as yeah. well as in developing new cities? No, I think artificial intelligence would be a, a tremendous tool to deploy in the context of what I've been talking about, in the context of personalizing the making of materials, but also discovering new ones. And, and these activities do not have to be confined to a laboratory because the, the initial discovery is made in the laboratory, but then it's fanned out to the public, sub, you know, subcontracted to the public to make their own tailor-made materials. So I'm talking about a world where there are, there's this uh, ability to have materials on demand mm -hmm. that can be made by uh, um, people that are not in a laboratory. So, um, uh, and that, that for sure will require artificial intelligence uh, me, uh, as a, to be used as a tool. Yeah. Ian, I want to get your take on AI as well. Uh, we've seen robotics become a huge area and companies talking about introducing robots into whether it be a, a restaurant service, a hotel service, or as you perhaps mentioned earlier, a drone service to, to fix buildings. Um, what role will robots play in, in the future of our cities? How, how widespread will they be? I think there are different kinds of jobs that uh, we do today. Sometimes people are employed basically as machines. You know, they, they, they sweep the streets or they type programs or whatever it might. You, you're basically a machine when you're doing those sorts of jobs. I think those jobs in due course will be automated. The jobs which are left are those which are not so easy for computers to do, primarily because the computers are not humans. And there are some jobs which humans do, which you, you're valuing their humanity. Now, an AI can upskill you. You know, I compose music and I do art, but I'm rubbish at it. If I was given access to AI, which can do some of that for me, I could produce better quality music and write better, uh, produce better quality artworks. So I see AI as a means of upskilling me, but I also see myself focusing more on the human skills, interpersonal skills, caring skills. In fact, I call it the care economy. 
and it's what's left once you've automated the physical jobs using robotics and the professional jobs using AI. Uh, when they've gone, what you're left with are those jobs that rely on you being a human being. And there's a species prejudice here. You know, the robot could do it, but you think, well, if you're dying of cancer in a hospital bed and R2-D2 trundles up and says, it's okay, you know, it's, everything's going to be fine, you won't have much respect for that robot. It's just a robot. It's just a machine. If a human being, you know, a nurse or a doctor comes over and gives you genuine human interaction, you value that because they're human too. So we value some things because they're human and you can't automate those jobs. So I see us focusing more on those human jobs uh, and that involves crafts, entertainment, uh, sports, you know, teaching, policing. A lot of jobs fall into that category. At the moment it's about 25 to 30 percent of jobs. It'll grow to 100 percent because the rest of them can be done better by computers and, and machines. But that really means that also when we're looking at the buildings and the accommodation in the future, we also have to allow for the presence of all these extra androids and robots who are gonna be living in our homes doing all these extra jobs. So you might have two or three people living in a, in a flat or a house, but you might have another five or six robots living in there doing jobs too. We have to think about them as future citizens alongside. And some of those will have AIs superior to humans in terms of playing chess and doing other things. Um, but, you know, the humans will have a very distinct role. And I think that uh, we will still be working in the future. We just won't think of it as work because it's the stuff we actually enjoy doing. Well, well Elon Musk, who we saw on the screen not long ago, has said, you know, He's warned on, on the rise of, of, of AI consciousness. He's yes. also um, warned that actually there needs to be some sort of merging between the human and machine environment. He's working on, on that when it comes to Neuralink, his other startup. Um, is that something you see as, as realistic, a, a merging between a human and computer brain? Yeah, that was actually a direct conclusion of a report of a lecture I did in 1997. You know, the, he's, he's a bit led to the party in some respects. You know, it's very welcome to see his contributions, but a lot of us have been discussing these issues for a long time. The, 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 the fact is that AI can go far, far further than humans. It could be billions of times smarter than humans in principle. So we really do need to make sure that we have some means of keeping up uh, because if you've got a computer which is a billion times smarter than you and it comes up with this fantastic new science research project which just happens to eliminate Dubai as part of the research budget you know some people will be wiped out by that and that's not a thing we want to welcome now the way to protect against that is to link that AI directly to your brain so that you have the same IQ the same intelligence as the computer so I don't actually think it's safe, just like Elon Musk, uh, I don't think it's safe to develop these superhuman computers until we have a direct link to the human brain which allows us to keep up with them and then they don't get way ahead and they don't treat us as just collateral damage in some experiment they want to do. Uh, Omar, all of this really comes back to how can you develop new technologies responsibly um, as well. And so. Uh, as you sit here at the World Government Summit with, with people in governments in the room, how do you um, suggest that they go about developing new technology in a responsible way that's beneficial to the entire society? I mean, a lot of uh, problems, maybe all problems of society uh, could be solved by new discoveries because they, new discoveries change the way we think, change the equation and, and present new solutions that were not thought of before. Um, at the heart of that is, of course, the individual and, and the individual who goes into an endeavor and does the research. Well, research, as we heard a little bit from the previous lecture, uh, is full of failures. So it needs a very special uh, researcher that understands that um, you know, failing every day is okay. It's, uh, those are steps towards success. How do we create that individual, right? How do we train people, mentor people, uh, students, on how the positiveness of failure, especially in research, you're going into an unknown world and a chaotic world. Um, there is no blueprint for discovery. 
Okay, we can talk about all these fancy things, but, but if you look deep down into how we uh, arrived at this sophisticated material or sophisticated interface with electronics and so on, um, you find that at the very heart of it, somebody was doing the research, the arduous research, that sometimes is extremely slow and is moving at the time scales that governments and the people who fund the research uh, are not working on that time scale. And so we need to match those time scales much better. I think, I think the people that fund research should understand that research is really an investment and the product of this research, when it's not a product that you can sell in the market, it's a product in improving the strength and the will of the individual to solve problems. Mm. Is that the individual is more uh, um, uh, uh, powerful in terms of thinking outside the box. So we should not forget about the power of uh, the product that is the individual and how they solve problems and how they navigate through the chaos of the unknown. Mm. Okay, that's not a trivial point, but it is an important component of getting to a lot of the sophisticated things that we are using today. Ian, from your perspective as well, we've spoken a little bit about AI. How, do, how does that particularly get regulated? How should governments go about developing it? Um, as it gets more advanced? I, I, I look at AI as a stimulative technology. You know, we've gone through the period now of disruptive technology. I think we're coming out of the other end of that. Most of the disruption has already happened. Uh, what we're seeing with things like AI and 3D printing and new materials science, they're actually stimulative. They create far more than they're destroying. So they disrupt a few things here and there but they create entirely new industries. The sort of stuff that Professor Yagi is working on is creating new opportunities. It's not just disrupting what's happening at the moment. And I'm very encouraged by that. This new field allows us to do a great deal. But the artificial intelligence, it's, a, it's on a positive feedback loop where the, uh, today's AI can accelerate the development of the next generation AI. So we're going past Moore's law. It's, Moore's law is accelerating now into a positive feedback loop. And that gives us the potential to have AIs which can greatly accelerate the rate of development. But you do come back to what Professor Yogi's just said, that you need to work out how, you know, what problems it is that we're facing. How do we identify the problems at the fundamental level? Uh, how do we decide what it is that we actually want to get from this? Once you have that challenge, then the AIs can accelerate the development of the solutions. I see AI as our best friend, providing we can get the regulation in place to protect against the development of the rogue AI. But AI is as much a tool for the people who hate us as it is for those people who want to do the right thing. And we mustn't lose sight of the security risks of AI if it's used by terrorist groups or rogue states or anybody else, you know, the occasional mad scientist. It is tremendously powerful technology. We do need to make sure we have regulations in place to stop its spread and to limit how much access to the technology you get. These are very, very powerful technologies. We shouldn't allow just anybody to access them. Uh, just a final one, we've got less than a minute. Uh, I just want a quick, very quick high level view. Omar, what does the city of the future look like to you? Um, you may not like this answer, but I, I think that it, it will be more open and, and more spread out. Mm. Because I feel that we are increasingly making progress in personalizing a lot of the, um, the water supply, the energy supply, and so on, uh, that, that you know, these cities have uh, aggregated. Mm -hmm. You know, now you can shop um, on your on your iPhone, you don't need to go to the market to yeah. to buy you know your next suit or your next shirt. So so I think things are going to spread out more. Um, Ian, very quickly, ten seconds. What does it look like? Yeah, I mean we have the potential for technology to make the world much much better. We need good quality leadership to try to stand the right directions because uh, you know we are facing a choice of which way we go. Do we want to go this way or that way? Never in the history of mankind has leadership been more important than it is today. 
Very insightful conversation. Ian Omar, thank you so much thank for your you. time. Round of applause for our panelists here.